afternoon, everyone. My name is Josie Foss. I am the co-director of the Center for Property Tax Reform and the executive director of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, our goal here is really to learn what a land value tax or a split rate tax is and a little bit about how to implement it. Um, so our program is going to be in three parts. I'll start us out. Um, we'll talk a little bit about traditional property taxes just so that we get the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, then I'll introduce kind of the underpinnings of land value tax, its expected effects, um, and a little bit about how to implement it. Then I'm going to turn it over to my co-director, Josh Vincent. Um, Josh has a huge amount of experience implementing land value tax and split rate tax in the real world. So he's going to draw on that um, to walk us through some, some implementation experiences. Uh, and finally, we'll turn it over to our geospatial full stack developer, uh, Mike Ward. Mike is going to do a little tour of a tool that we've developed called the Tax Shift Explorer. The Tax Shift Explorer is kind of um, the ultimate window into land value tax in that it allows users to look at the actual effects of implementation sort of at the municipal level and then drilling all the way down to the individual parcel level. So let's start with a little bit about um, property taxes. What are they? So first and foremost, property taxes at the local level are extremely important. Um, they generally form the backbone of municipal budgets. I think the typically, you know, 70% or more of those budgets do come from property tax revenues. The particulars of how the taxes levy vary a lot across jurisdictions. Um, but in order to levy a tax of this sort, you have to have valuations of every single parcel in the municipality. So that's sort of the basics, right? Um, most of those assessments or most of those valuations are done using computer assisted mass appraisal software or CAMA software. And that software essentially uses um, value data. Sometimes it's MLS or sales data. Sometimes it's not, it, it kind of depends on the jurisdiction. Um, to create or represent comparables. And those parcels are then used, or those values and characteristics are then used to impute the values for every other parcel in the jurisdiction. The goal of property tax assessment at its most basic level is to create fair and equitable assessments for all property owners. And that is, you know, as we would want it to be. Um, so CAMA models are often really key in doing that. Um, but the other thing that's key in doing that is a whole lot of testing to try and detect bias in the distribution of assessments. And so bias looks like um, instances where there's a departure from that sort of equitable ratio of property value to tax bill. Um, so that's going to become uh, an important concept when we get a little bit farther into the presentation and talk about the benefits of a land value tax. Functionally, those assessments consist of two pieces, right? The value of the property's land and the value of the property's improvements. So land is as what it sounds like, it's the land. Uh, it's what you generally stand on and build on. Um, the improvements can be buildings, they can be you know, significant alterations to the land, um, but most often and most familiar, they're things like houses and businesses, um, so structures that people have, have built. Um, Typically, in an assessment aims to have accurate values for the improvements and for the land. So the holistic number should reflect market value. But when you digest it into those two parts, you want to see that the portion of it that repre is represented by improvement value is accurate and the portion that um, is land value is also accurate. There's a little bit of a departure that often happens in the assessment profession when it comes to that, and it can be problematic or at least something to be aware of in implementing land value tax, which is that sometimes assessors shoot for that overall number to be accurate. They always shoot for it to be accurate. But when it comes to the division of what of that total is constituted by improvement value versus land value, sometimes land value becomes a residual. And by that, I mean, we have an accurate total, 80% of that total is going to be assigned to the improvement value and 20% is going to be assigned to the land value. And so it's actually a pretty common practice. It's obviously a rule of thumb that's probably, you know, generally defensible, but when you get down to the level of the individual parcel, things may fall apart. Um, so when you're applying a single tax rate, it's really not an issue. Um, when you're applying different rates or only taxing land, which is what we're talking about today, it can become a little bit of an issue. And then in extreme instances, 
um, we're actually seeing assessment data where there are no land values. So um, right now I'm thinking specifically of New England uh, condo, residential condos. And so when you let, look at their tax data, they will have a taxable amount. Um, but when you look one step farther, the entirety of that taxable amount will actually be the improvement value and land is valued at zero, which is, um, you know, which is a choice. Obviously, condos are not floating in the air. They are actually on land. And so um, that, again, is something to, to realize or to be uh, mindful of uh, when you're looking to switch to a land value or a um, split rate tax. So calculating an individual's um, parcels bill is actually really straightforward. So you take that total valuation, land and improvements, and you apply a single tax rate to it. That gives you the tax bill or the tax liability. And that's how traditional property taxes um, are, are, are calculated. It obviously gets a little bit more complicated in the real world because you have things like exemptions and abatements that affect people's tax liabilities. And then often, uh, taxing jurisdictions kind of complicate matters further. Um, for example, thinking about New York City, there are different classes of properties in New York. They have, each has a different tax rate, and that rate is applied to a different portion of the overall assessment for each of those classes. And then you have abatements and exemptions on top of that. And as you can imagine, um, it gets complicated pretty quickly. Um, so how is a land value or a split rate tax different from a traditional property tax. So this is obviously um, something that, that we're focused on today. So let's get right into it. Let's start with the definitions because they're related, um, but the nomenclature here can get a little bit muddy depending on who you're talking to. So I just wanna be really clear about uh, when I'm using terminology, what I'm referring to. So a land value tax or a true land value tax, um, as, as I call it, uh, is basically a methodology for calculating a tax liability, which relies on applying that tax rate to the land value alone. A split rate tax is sort of a hybrid of a traditional property tax and a land value tax because you are taxing improvements, but you're applying different tax rates to the value of the land versus the value of the improvement. So if you look right over here on the screen, you'll see essentially how to calculate those two things. And then this is just a little graphic um, that we've developed. This is on our website. I think we've put it out on social media as well um, to help illustrate these concepts. So in the middle is a traditional US property tax where we have a single tax rate applied to both the improvement um, and the land values summed together. On either side of that, you have split rate taxes um, the side that's highlighted in that like light blue is really the area where the Center for Property Tax Reform focuses because that is the area where the portion of the bill that derives from land value is higher than the portion from improvement value. And then all the way over on the side where you see that sort of floating chunk of land is what we're calling a true land value tax, which is where only the assessed value of the land uh, is going to receive a tax bill or the tax bill is calculated only on the assessed value of the land. Okay, so let's talk about some of the key takeaways around a land value tax. I think one of the biggest and one of the ones that needs to be kind of addressed first is that generally a land value tax can be, can be created using current assessments. And this is huge. So obviously the assessing profession is very old. There's a lot of individuals involved in it who are you know, highly professionalized, who have a lot of experience, who have tried and true methodologies and the data they're producing are great. When you start talking about touching a property tax system, those folks naturally may have an allergic reaction. So one of the first things to do is to realize we're not reinventing the wheel, okay? You already have your assessments and in all likelihood, your assessments are going to be uh, sufficient to convert to a land value or a split rate tax. Um, couple instances where they where you may need to do a little bit digger, deeper digging or more thought maybe need to need to be given um, would be instances like the New England condo example where you don't have land values. Clearly, if you're taxing land values that are all zero, then those property owners are not going to be taxed, which is not the intention here. So you do want to be sure, you know, that your your assessments are accurate and unbiased. Um, but a lot of them or most of them are. And so when they are, a land value tax um, is a viable option. The next thing to highlight is that it's not that hard. So we saw those equations right at the beginning of how a traditional property tax is calculated and how a land value tax is calculated. It's simple algebra. 
Um, so this is not, again, this, this should not take anybody out of their comfort zone or be too hard to understand. Um, although there are a lot of nuances to it and a lot of best practices that you wanna be mindful of, this is not uh, rocket science. This is a big one. Every single tax bill will change when you switch from a traditional property tax to a, you know, to a land value or split rate tax. Just as every tax bill generally will change with a reassessment, um, if your value changes, your tax bill changes. Um, but here it's not simply a reassessment, which folks are, you know, may not like, but because values tend to go up, um, but they're generally familiar with. Here you are literally rejiggering your tax code. And so changing every tax taxpayer's bill is something that you just need to be aware is going to happen. So why would you do this? If you're using your existing assessments and it's simple math, uh, but it changes everybody's bill, why the heck would you bother with this? Uh, so let's spend some time talking about why, because there's some really compelling reasons. One of the first reasons is that a land value or split rate tax disincentivizes land speculation. And when you think about it, this makes perfect sense. So people who have land that they're holding vacant or idle under the current property tax system are generally being signaled by that tax system that it's okay to do that. And the reason that they're receiving that signal is that their bills are really low, okay? When a portion of your bill is on the improvements, but you don't have any improvements, your bill is gonna be a lot lower than somebody who owns the same amount of land, but maybe has a house or a business on it. When you go to a land value tax, you take that improvement element out of the equation, literally. And so the person who's been holding their land under use suddenly see their, sees their tax bill go way up. And the sort of, um, you know, the, the reciprocal of that is that the overall um, population of taxpayers who have improvements will see their tax bill go down. And so they don't all go down by the same amount, right? But if you're keeping things revenue neutral, which I'll talk about a little bit later, if you're keeping your tax um, take equal across these changes, if somebody's bill goes up, which vacant and idle property owners see their bills go up, that's what they see, somebody else's bill goes down. Um, so you're actually disincentivizing that land speculation. Folks can still do it. You know, you can say, all right, my bill went up. I'm just going to pay it. I don't feel like doing anything with this land, but at least they're paying full freight and taxation. Um, more likely, though, is that they'll say, geez, maybe I should improve this land because actually my bill won't go up if I do. So I can start making productive use or if I'm not going to do it, maybe I sell to somebody who is. And so that is an important hallmark of a land value tax. In that way, it encourages redevelopment, right? If you've been holding land in the hopes of making a killing when you sell it, um, but suddenly your bill goes up and so, heck, I got to do something with this. Well, that something looks like redevelopment. The next step of that is that it's actually been shown to discourage sprawl. So, you know, sprawl is that sort of growth at the periphery, that sort of metastasizing of communities out into green space. Well, when those interior parcels become available or become reused and therefore available to folks to live in or work in or whatnot, it reduces that pressure at the, at the periphery. And we actually see, um, and there are studies that have shown, a reduction in sprawl. A land value tax is also this sort of effective ongoing value capture strategy. And so value capture is, you know, on everybody's minds and lips. It's this notion of essentially closing this the cycle and recapturing public investments for the public good, right? Like recapturing that money that we're putting into um, public amenities and making it available again to continue to support and expand those amenities. Property tax in general is pretty good at doing that. A land value tax is actually even better at doing that. And it makes sense when you think about it. So improvements are the product of people's labor, right? And personal resources and investments. So if I'm building a house or an addition on my house or a business, like that's coming out of my pocket, I'm doing um, The land is different though, right? Because land isn't something that we've built. I mean, we may improve it. We may, you know, do things to grade the land or whatnot, uh, but the land pre-existed us and in all likelihood, the land will far outlive us, right? So it's a different animal, it's a natural resource. The value of land also in large part derives from where it is and what it gives you access to. So we've all heard that adage, location, location, location in real estate, right? Mostly what it's saying. Now, if it's beachfront property, 
there, you know, there's some exceptions, but a lot of what that's talking about is the public amenities that you have access to by virtue of owning that land. So if you have valuable property, chances are that property has, you know, good public services, good roads, uh, public safety, public schools. It gives you access to entertainment and jobs, um, sort of those things that are not solely the product of the property owner. And so as that aspect of the property becomes more valuable, it typically reflects public investments that, that the property, owning the property gives you access to. And so those more highly valued properties pay more because their land is worth more because the land benefits from more of these public investments. And so in that way, you do have this sort of virtual, virtuous cycle. Land value tax and split rate taxes also tend to be more progressive. And this is something that you, again, like you, you never wanna just pull the trigger, not that you really even could, but on one of these tax changes without really understanding exactly what's gonna happen on the ground and what's gonna happen with people's tax bills. But generally what we see is that when municipalities switch from a traditional property tax to a land value or split rate tax, um, that the individuals with lower value properties who tend to be lower income folks are paying a proportionately lower part of their resources into property tax than people with the more valuable properties who also tend to be more affluent. And so there's certainly an equity issue in play as well. The last thing I'm gonna highlight here um, is one that I, I feel like I talk about a lot with folks. And that is just that land at this point in time with the technology that we have, the remote sensing technology, the GIS technology that we have is easier to value accurately than improvements. And I know that um, sort of historically there's been a narrative or a conversation around how it's really hard to value land, but property, you know, but improvements, you can value a house, you can value a, a business. Now though, land is completely visible to all of us in this sort of unobstructed way right? Um, improvements just aren't. So we talked about the use of camera modeling, of this sort of um, imputing values through comps. Well, that's great. It's obviously dependent on finding good comps, but it's also dependent on really knowing what's inside those structures. And it's hard to do if you're not going around knocking on people's doors, which by and large assessors don't do. So, you know, there's all kinds of workarounds. There's, you know, third-party software companies that monitor Airbnb or Verbo and contact the assessor and say, hey, you know, this is listed, you have this as a two bedroom, but they're trying to rent it out as a three bedroom, you know, th th those kinds of things. But boy, oh boy, that's a lot of work, right? Valuing land is something that you can do in a much more arm's length way and you can do in a really transparent and defensible way. Um, so there's, there's, you know, folks out there that are working on this. We actually have a project in the works um, related to this as well, which is um, essentially you know, using market value to derive uh, a value surface for an entire municipality um, and attributing that value surface to, you know, land values and then using the parcel shapes, almost like cookie cutters to, to punch out the value of the individual parcels land value to which you then apply your tax rate and you get a bill. So how do you do this well? Um, because you can do a lot of things, uh, but you have to do them in a way that is going to actually make people better off and not make everybody super mad, right? So let's get a little bit into the weeds on how to do it. The first thing is that you have to have accurate assessments. That's really, really key. Now, obviously if your assessments are inaccurate and you're levying any kind of property tax, um, you know, that's going to be an issue. So this is not unique to land value tax, but because a land value tax or a split rate tax divorces land value from improvement value, you really have to be certain that your valuations are accurate for the land value piece of it. Um, and so we talked earlier about some, some times when that might not be the case. So that is, that's a need. You know, if what you've been going with is a single tax rate applied to the total value and been getting good, good tax bills that are defensible, that's not, it's not a foregone conclusion that when you get to that more granular level of only taxing land or preferentially taxing land, um, that you'll continue to have those good results. So you gotta be really um, mindful of your tax data quality. We also recommend very strongly that you roll this out in a revenue neutral fashion. And what that means is that whatever you, whatever your total tax take from property tax was prior to implementation, you should aim to have that be the same when you initially roll out your implementation, okay? And we talked about the fact that everybody's tax bill changes. 
that's already enough of upsetting the apple cart. You don't want to then on top of it say, oh, and we're also bringing in more revenue. You just, you're working with a lot of constituents when you're doing this work and you know, you've already set enough things in motion. The other piece that we also recommend is that when you're doing this, you roll it out in sort of a stepped fashion. So whatever your ultimate goal is, let's say it's a true land value tax where you're untaxing improvements completely, you go from an equal rate and then sort of year by year, you move in 10 percentage point increments until you reach that land value tax. Again, because you don't wanna sort of shock the system. You wanna give people time to understand what's happening and see how their bills are changing. You also want to understand those immediate impacts, and that is where the tool we're going to look at at the end, the Tax Shift Explorer, really comes in handy or something analogous to that um, because everybody's tax bill is going to change. They're going to want to see, you know, who, who's, who's winning, who's losing, how am I doing? So you want to have those numbers ready. The other reason it's really important is that different constituents will be affected differently, right? So if you think about it, you can imagine pretty quickly who might be vocal under a land value tax scenario. Think about like a used car lot. Okay, so in a traditional property tax, their improvements are probably pretty minimal. Um, most of their, you know, bill is going to be pretty low, right, most likely. Land value tax, doesn't matter what their improvements are, but they've got a lot of land, okay? And so, you know, you, you know those corridors, we're all familiar with them along a highway where you've got, you know, multiple car, car lots, they can get together pretty quickly and give you a headache, all right? So you wanna know that that's coming. The same time, the folks who do tend to benefit, you know, those lower income residents, which is who we want to benefit and who we typically see benefit, but they're also the people who may not be as vocal in the transition as people like the car lots, right? Um, and it, it has to do with resources, it has to do with communication and ability to participate in terms of time availability and whatnot. Um, but again, you just, you wanna be really crystal clear at the outset who is, who's better off, who's maybe not as well off um, and how you're gonna manage um, the communications. Outreach and education, you cannot, I cannot overstate the importance of these things. Again, you are talking about a policy that is gonna hit every person, whether directly in the form of their tax bill or indirectly in the form of their rent. Um, and so you really want to be very, very clear with people why you're doing this and give them the opportunity to ask questions. There's all sorts of best practices in assessing in terms of reaching out to different communities and different constituents. Um, and so as you're thinking about implementing a land value tax, you really should, uh, catch up with the IAAO, which is their professional association um, resources, or you know, talk to your assessor about how to do this the right way, because uh, you do want to be sure that this is not blindsiding people. You know, everybody's going to be happy if their bill goes down, but if you're keeping revenues neutral, some people's bills will go up and others will go down, and so you just want to be sure that everybody has a chance to understand why you're doing what you're doing and really know what it's going to mean for them personally. Okay, so that's it for me. Um, thanks so much for listening to this part of the presentation. I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Josh Vincent, who is the co-director of the Center for Property Tax Reform and the executive director of the Center for the Study of Economics. Thank you. Hi, you've heard about the land value tax in the expected theoretical framework, and I'd like to thank Josie for that great presentation. I'm here to talk about how it's implemented uh, what are the results and what are the expected hope for outcomes? My name is Josh Vincent and I'm the executive director of the Center for the Study of Economics and we partner with the Robert Schalkenbach Foundation in a project called the Center for Property Tax Reform. We hope that this project will become sort of a go-to source for education, outreach and advice on land value taxation and how it can work in most if not all communities. Now we started the Center for the Study of Economics in 1926 as the Henry George Foundation of America. And we were started in Southwestern Pennsylvania, specifically the city of Pittsburgh by uh, progressive politicians in the early 20th century sense of the meeting. Uh, future, several future governors of Pennsylvania, David Lawrence comes to mind, uh, several future Congress people from Southwest Pennsylvania and many, many city council members of various cities in that area saw the need for a nonprofit 
to do objective empirical research into land value taxation, to educate other communities about land value taxation, and to uh, do outreach with communities to go from town to town. We don't have to go town to town anymore, so we're here and hopefully we're going to reach a lot more people. So I think the best way to jump into land value taxation is to uh, look at an actual case study of a wasted piece of land in a major American city. Now this is a vacant lot. It's in Hartford, Connecticut. It's right in the downtown. It's close to businesses and it's close to the state capital where there are a lot of state workers that drive in from the suburbs every day. And uh, it's about half a full city block. And it's assessed at $2.7 million. It's probably worth more than that, but we'll, we'll accept that. And uh, it used to be a Hilton Hotel was on this site until about 1980, and then it was demolished uh, to save on taxes. And it was demolished by uh, an owner who lives somewhere in New York City and uh, says, yes, I'll build something someday when market conditions are right. Well, nothing's been built since Ronald Reagan was president. So because it's worth $2.7 million, under the current tax rate, which is just under 1%, uh, 72.9 mils, uh, the annual property taxes on this valuable lot served by infrastructure is about $193,000 a year. Uh, that is peanuts, of course, for somebody that is going to make a killing and owns lots of other properties in other cities and other states. So that $193,000 means the landowner can sit on this parcel for years if need be until uh, the owner gets the price he wants or uh, more likely the city makes him an offer he can't refuse and pays him an extortionate amount for the land and uh, he gives, gives it up uh, gladly. So that's a problem right there. That's the perverse incentive of sitting on vacant land. The uh, tax rate is low and nothing compels the uh, property owner to change that. And you'll notice that the parking lot is filled with cars. It's a paid parking lot, of course and the finance uh, folks in the city of Hartford City Council uh, say that they pay off their property taxes uh, after about 25 or 30 working days each year and the rest is gravy. This parking lot is full from 8 o'clock to about 5 o'clock Monday through Friday and after that it's vacant, it's abandoned, uh, nobody comes by. A lot of cities have this problem. Interestingly, there's tons of parking on the street, on Asylum Street, free parking or, or uh, metered parking, I should say, but nobody takes advantage because of the perceived uh, cluster uh, benefit of having a bunch of cars in one spot where somebody in a shack, I guess, keeps their eye on it. So what if we had a land value tax? A land value tax would mean then an effective rate of 3.93% uh, on the land and not taxing the building at all in this case. So uh, if we had a land value tax, the tax bill for this lot would go up to $1.01 uh, $01 million a year. Let's call it $1 million a year. Uh, that is enough money to make the uh, absentee property owner or more appropriately, his accountant to say, what's going on here? Sell it, get rid of it, or build something. And that's, uh, that's the reason that a land tax makes sense when there's a lot of vacancy and when there's a lot of underuse or blight. Uh, some people might say a parking lot is a productive use of land. I wouldn't. So if there were a land value tax, things would change utterly. Now, under the current system, if somebody put up a 15-story building, the building itself would pay $4.5 million a year in taxes. We're assuming a $50 million building here. So uh, if we had a land value tax, it would still pay a million dollars a year, 
but it wouldn't be paying anything on the building. So it makes sense to put up a building now. And this four and a half million dollars a year under the traditional flat rate property tax essentially uh, puts this lot out of the running for a builder. A builder wants to get a building up uh, and done and get tenants quickly. And it's easier to do that in the suburbs uh, because of the lower property tax rates. So uh, if we have a land value tax and you put up that building and you're not charged taxes on the building, but you're taxed on the fair value of the land, the land value that has been created by the community and by the government, the city government, the decrease in that tax bill will allow the builder and developer to capitalize those savings into a selling price, allowing for higher profits per unit or the ability to sell units for less, resulting in more units sold. So it's a good capitalist endeavor for somebody that wants to build and actually wants to profit on their personal private investment uh, in both the labor and the capital necessary to put the skyscraper up. So now that we've seen what a land value tax in dollars and cents can do uh, for a city and do to a recalcitrant landowner, uh, we should probably move to Pennsylvania, which has had the longest and biggest experience with land value taxation. Uh, this is a list of the cities that use land value taxation. The first city that, that deployed LVT was Pittsburgh in 1911 and Scranton in 1913. Uh, since then, we've got uh, 18 cities and school districts that use the land value tax. Interestingly, let me grab my handy-dandy highlighter. Interestingly, uh, the tax rates run the gamut. Uh, in a place like uh, Duquesne, for example, the tax rate is 15 mils on uh, buildings and 20 mils on land. Really not much of a difference. The ratio of, of land tax to building tax is 1.3 to zero. Uh, the borough of Milbourne in Delaware County has no tax on uh, buildings at all. So their tax rate is 55 mils. And so the ratio it doesn't exist really. Uh, but as you can see in places like uh, Clareton and in Aliquippa and uh, Washington, Pennsylvania, and uh, even Harrisburg, the ratios are generally about five to one or six to one of uh, land tax to building tax. Uh, and most of these communities adopted land value tax uh, in the 1970s and onwards during the uh, end of the steel economy and when they, essentially the cities had to pay the bills somehow. And a lot of them went into bankruptcy. It's called Act 47 receivership. And a lot of our LVT cities adopted land value tax on the recommendation of the uh, state receiver uh, who uh, would hope that the cities could pay their utility bills and essentially keep the lights on while providing some sort of a tax break to the newly unemployed steel workers and the newly uh, retired steel workers. And it's, uh, that's really been the reason why this happened. So the question is, of course, can Pennsylvania be a guide? Uh, I, I believe it can because the fiscal realities of Pennsylvania cities in the 1970s and 80s are actually reverberating throughout the country as we speak. So under what circumstances does a land value tax uh, come in? How does it work? Well, uh, LVT, you know, what is it? It's a type of real property tax. Uh, the property tax typically taxes land and improvements at the same rate. An LVT applies to land at a higher rate, and then you put a lower rate on buildings, as you saw on the previous chart. Uh, to be clear, Clareton, which is in Allegheny County, is a former uh, steel town, and now U.S. Steel owns about 30% of the land value in town, with almost no buildings on that land. And that's good for the city, because otherwise it couldn't afford to pay for its schools, and it couldn't afford to keep the streets paved and the street lights on. That's the reason the uh, state receiver uh, recommended land value taxation for Clareton. 
And currently, uh, the tax rate is 103 mills on land for both the city and schools, and uh, about 4.32 mills for uh, the buildings. And the benefit to the city of Clareton is pretty clear. If there's a property owner that has lots and lots of vacant land, they're going to pay the land share of uh, property tax revenues. And in Clareton, U.S. Steel, which uh, barely operates now in, in Pennsylvania and in the United States, uh, they pay for services. They pay for schools and they pay for infrastructure. And the lower tax on buildings is starting to encourage growth in the city where there had been none previously. So we're going to move to another city in Pennsylvania, uh, one that I'm sure most of you are more familiar with, and that's Harrisburg, the state capital. Just to set the stage uh, for all of you, uh, Harrisburg is the state capital, has just about half of its land off the tax rolls, and of course it's the most valuable land in the city. Uh, now on to land value tax. In 1975, Hurricane Agnes parked itself over northeast Pennsylvania, and it was there for about four days. Uh, the Susquehanna Valley uh, was wiped out with uh, both infrastructure and buildings. Uh, in Harrisburg, which was flooded for a couple of weeks, uh, then Mayor Swenson pushed for LVT adoption to provide an incentive for private in investment to return and to disincentivize absentee property owners whose business model depended on abandonment and decay for their own riches down the road. Uh, I spoke to Bob Kroboth, who is the uh, city uh, finance director for many years, and he said that entire neighborhoods uh, prior to 1972 that were 85% owner-occupied almost overnight became 85% vacant or low-cost rentals. Uh, absentee slumlords, elevated crime rates, and blight were costs that uh, they continued to pay years after Agnes. And the land value tax was intended essentially to make it untenable for the absentee property owner and the slumlord to operate in Harrisburg. And another interesting uh, piece of, of the development puzzle in Harrisburg uh, has been, uh, as, as Bob Kroboth said, for an urban center, the land tax is crucial. And I can't imagine the concept not being effective as long as it's in place uh, as a part of a package of incentives. And we you have to do a good job of explaining why people are better off. And the facts uh, on the ground in Harrisburg have really shown that in the face of a lot of uh, headwinds, Harrisburg has done pretty well. There's been about $5 billion worth of direct investment uh, since uh, land value tax came in. Uh, taxable value of the city went up from $212 million to $1.6 billion in about 15 years. Uh, the number of vacant units, vacant properties, was reduced uh, pretty dramatically, and homesteaders are coming back. And uh, one thing that's interesting is that the crime rate dropped. Once you have people coming back, you have more eyes on the street. Now, what you see in front of you is uh, a, a downtown Harrisburg, and in 1982, sort of at, at the nadir, uh, you see a bunch of old mercantile buildings. Uh, some of them are occupied on the first floor. Uh, all of them are boarded up uh, above the first floor, and uh, they are now uh, torn down. They were obsolescent, and uh, a very uh, full, nice full service Hilton has taken its place. And uh, the mayor of Harrisburg promised the developers, you'll get a tax package, you'll get a tax break uh, for the first 10 years. But after 10 years, uh, you're still going to save a lot because we're not taxing the buildings nearly as much as would have we would have with the flat tax. So uh, he believes that convinced uh, the, the builders to make it a better, nicer, and bigger hotel. Uh, other state capitals like Albany, Hartford, uh, Richmond, Trenton, uh, they struggle and have to subsidize, they have to sweeten the pot for growth. And growth happens, uh, as the mayor of Harrisburg said, Mayor Reed, growth happens without ribbon cutting ceremonies. 
So that's why he liked it. Some of the latest uh, research that my outfit has done is based on taxable residential building permits. And the increase or decrease in issuance is a pretty good guide, a lot of economists and analysts feel, for measuring the success of a land value tax. Uh, that, that methodology has been replicated by many other researchers and academics. Uh, here, uh, Harrisburg is compared to an analog city, Albany, New York. Uh, and uh, Albany is almost a carbon copy of Harrisburg, except for a few very significant reasons why. So after the last significant shift uh, in land value tax in 2003, the succeeding years showed uh, an unmistakable and statistically significant increase measured by the raw data and a linear progression for both cities. And this is residential building permits per capita uh, in Harrisburg and Albany. And you can see that you know, Albany and Harrisburg were pretty much on the same level until the last big expansion in 2003. Uh, another one is uh, underway and the school district is exploring uh, legislative permission to do a land value tax. But you see after 2003, I think I can yeah, highlight it there, that uh, things really took off for Harrisburg. Yeah, the general uh, increase in, in the property market had an effect, but uh, Harrisburg has then and since outstripped their analog city, Albany, on taxable residential building permits. More valuable buildings uh, are being put up. When we look at other cities, there are small to medium-sized cities in Pennsylvania. And uh, over the years, as towns have introduced LVT, uh, we and uh, others, like the Lincoln Institute and uh, many academics from the University of Pittsburgh have studied the results of LVT in the older uh, post-industrial cities of Pennsylvania. And you can see that the average building permits from three years before and after adoption of LVT all have statistically significant uh, correlations. Uh, Scranton expanded LVT dramatically in 1979. Uh, Wilkes-Barre still has uh, the flat rate and their increase in taxable building permits took off. Uh, interestingly, when McKeesport first uh, introduced land value tax, their uh, sister cities of Duquesne and Clareton, all suffering under the collapse of the steel industry, uh, saw dramatic decreases in taxable building permits because LVT indicated uh, and of course proved that it was cheaper to build and to renovate in McKeesport than the other sister cities. It's not, I don't think much of a shock that the other two cities did adopt land value tax and Clareton has really uh, picked the ball and run with it. Uh, same with Newcastle, which is in Northwestern uh, Pennsylvania. And compared to pretty close neighboring cities, Farrell and Sharon uh, in Mercer County, Pennsylvania. They're about 30 miles uh, away from each other, all of them. Uh, Newcastle increased uh, quite a bit and uh, Farrell and Sharon unhappily uh, dropped right, right out of the league tables, as they say. Uh, Sharon and Farrell have never really recovered from the collapse of the steel industry. Uh, Newcastle at least has found some time to breathe uh, thanks to the land value tax. So I'd like to thank you for uh, sitting through this. I hope it was interesting and I hope it raised some questions. And uh, there's a few bullet points I want to leave you with about what land value tax can do. You can read it for yourselves. But uh, most important uh, in my mind's eye, and especially the crises facing uh, cities and other built up areas, uh, is that if cities can avoid uh, giving away favors, subsidies, and abatements uh, in order to attract growth, the infamous race to the bottom can be slowed, at least in the United States. Uh, the idea of having uh, edifice complexes uh, taking the place of real, sustained, organic growth uh, is uh, to be preferred. Uh, 
So thank you very much and uh, stay tuned for Mike Ward. Uh, he's coming right up and he's going to show you what magic he does with maps and land values. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michael Ward and I'm the Center for Property Tax Reform's Geospatial Developer. I work on all of our web mapping applications and also assist on any research and analysis that involves spatial data. Uh, now that you've all had the chance to learn a little bit more about land value tax, its goals, and also heard about some examples of implementing land value tax, I'm really excited to share with you all a tool called the Tax Shift Explorer that we developed in order to visualize the effects of different split tax rates at both a micro and a macro level. As both Josie and Joss mentioned, one of the difficulties of implementing a land value tax is that it affects everyone's tax bill within a, within a municipality, regardless of the type of parcel. Um, both policymakers and residents want to know how a change to land value tax or just a shift towards land value tax is going to affect their tax bills and their municipality as a whole. So with this in mind, we developed Tax Shifts Explorer as a tool to empower policymakers and residents to learn about how a shift in property taxes will affect tax bills and revenue at the individual and at the municipal level. Um, so I'm here today to show you how Tax Shift Explorer works, as well as walk through one of the many cities that we've modeled using Tax Shift Explorer. So here we're looking at the city of St. Paul, Minnesota. And what is shown on the map is the city boundary, and that city boundary is then broken down into divisions. Um, for St. Paul, we broke it down using wards, but for other cities shown on Tax Shift Explorer, we may use city council districts, um, or neighborhoods. Uh, the purpose of breaking these down into divisions is so that we can see how um, a change in taxes is going to affect this um, individual areas of the city rather than just the city as a whole. Um, there's a couple of features on the website that are going to impact what data is actually being shown on the map here. Um, so to start, I just want to explain what the colors signify on the different boundaries on the city. Um, so within each word, um, it'll be filled in with a color that's going to correspond with the legend over here, um, where a white color is going to indicate no change in median tax bill. Warmer colors are going to indicate an increase in median tax bill, and cooler colors are going to designate a decrease in median tax bill, where it will be filled in black if there is missing data for that area. Um, so as far as what's actually going to show and impact the changes in the median tax bill. The main factor is going to be the slider down here, which is used to adjust the percent revenue garnered from land tax. Um, for each city, um, many already do derive a percentage of their revenue from land value tax. In this case, if you look up at the top here, St. Paul derives 25% of their current re um, tax revenue on property taxes from land tax. So at a 20% LVT, you're not seeing much change within each ward for the median tax bill. But as you start to slide this, move this slider around um, to 0% LVT or all the way up to 100% LVT, you're going to start to see those colors change to signify how the median tax bill is going to go up or down within each district of the city. Um, the other key factor that's going to indicate um, the changes on the map is going to be the land use type that you have toggled. So if you look over here on the towards the top right of the map, there's a button toggle here where you can choose between residential, commercial, mixed use, industrial, vacant land, non-tax buildings, or all land uses. So when you have one of these toggled, what you're looking at is just the change for that particular category within the city. So with all land use types, you're gonna see as a whole how any parcel within each district is going to change a median tax bill. But if you want to drill down and see how just residential change or just how vacant land changes, by toggling those, it's going to only show you the median tax bill change for those land use categories. So that's really useful for seeing how different um, property types are going to be affected um, at different rates for um, LVT. Um, in addition to the median tax bill indicator. You can also click on a district to get a pop-up showing um, a um, breakdown of the median tax bill change, as well as demographics for that portion of the city, which is useful to see 
you know, what type of residents are going to be affected within that district based on the change in property tax. Um, in addition to the overhead view, you can also go ahead and zoom in using your scroll to take a look at individual parcels within the city. So once you zoom in, you'll see little circles that are filled in with different colors that'll also correspond to the legend over here to indicate what type each parcel is. So the majority we have on the screen right here are all residential parcels. Um, once you have a parcel in mind that you wanted to find out more about, you can click on that parcel and it's going to give you the address as well as the assessed values for land tax and improvement tax, um, the actual tax bill, and then a small chart giving you a breakdown of how this specific parcel's tax bill will change at different um, LVT percentages. Um, so you can see for this parcel in particular, um, they're probably, um, oh, they're at about 8,300 in tax bill now, but if they were to increase um, the percentage revenue from LVT, they would actually see a decrease in their tax bill. Although that might not be the case for all residential properties, depending on what their assessments are for improvements and land value. Um, that mostly covers all of the functionalities on the map. Um, there is one other feature of the website that I wanna talk about, um, which is the city summary PDF, which you'll find over here on the land use type toggle. If you open that up, you'll be able to view a report that's going to break down the demographics for the entire city as well as a really useful chart that's going to show you the tax liability change breakdown across the entire city for each land use type. Uh, as mentioned previously, the land LVT is designed to be revenue neutral. So you can see no matter the LVT percentage applied on this table, the total tax liability remains pretty neutral across the board. Um, where you will see changes in each land use category at each percentage revenue would change from LVT. Um, so at 100% LVT in St. Paul, you'd see a 13% decrease overall in um, revenue and tax liability um, with a large increase um, being put onto vacant land and non-tax buildings. Um, this also, this report goes on to break this down um, via demographics and this table across all the awards or in other cities across the council districts or neighborhoods. So you might find this report useful if you wanna see more of a macro view of how this um, total city is gonna change or how a specific district within the city is going to change. Um, that about wraps up what I wanted to cover in terms of how to use TaxShift Explorer and what you might find useful on it. I wanna thank you all for your time to learn about LVT and the tools that we've developing. Uh, at this time, we'd like to open up the floor to um, discussion and questions that you might have. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I see we do have some questions in the Q&A, so uh, we're going to get through as many as we can in the time that we have. I know we started a couple minutes late. Um, so the first one, uh, which I think Josh sort of addressed a little bit in writing, but it's worth a discussion, um, came from Ronald uh, Menick. Once an LVT or split rate tax is implemented, then the overall market value of the property is expected to decrease. So there's endogeneity occurring, and this would affect estimation of the land's value once an LVT or split rate tax were implemented. So Josh, do you wanna kind of share your thoughts on that question? Cause I know there's a similar, not identical, but similar question farther down around decreases in land values or property, or property values as a whole. Yeah, um, I would, because uh, a lot of people that have talked about the land value tax over the past 100 some years have uh, said that there's an ironclad rule that a land value tax will lower property values. And I'm not so sure that's true. I know that Nick Tiedemann of Virginia Tech uh, took, a, took a hard look at this. And so does Stephen Barassa, uh, University of Pittsburgh. And this was some years ago. But uh, in real life, you're creating a universe called the city. And in that universe, if you're reducing other taxes, then that's going to make the land values, I think at the very least stable. Um, I think there's a good argument that the building value will decrease uh, simply because you're not taxing that value, you're removing that, that factor. So um, I, I, I think that if, if we think about the realities of picking a, a laboratory for experimentation 
and it is a city or a town that its behavior is going to be uh, different from the larger economy. I hope that helps. Yeah, I would also just add um, that there were some studies done in around 2020, so pretty recently, of the Pennsylvania experience. So like what has happened on the ground in Pennsylvania since these policies have been adopted um, and what they found, and they're on our website, um, and I think we can probably share out that doc after the event. Uh, but what they found was that actually residential home prices and commercial real estate prices did actually tend to increase after the implementation of the policy. So, you know, I've heard a lot of talk around this notion of depressed values in response to LVT. Um, not sure that it's necessary. It certainly doesn't appear to be a rule. Um, it does seem as if, you know, on the ground, things may play out a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question, I think, um, Josh, you're probably, again, well positioned to answer. How has the transition for assessors been in the case of Pennsylvania municipalities or other local govs uh, that have switched from regular to LVT or split rate systems? Was arriving at accurate assessments difficult? Did appeals significantly increase? Uh, the assessment question, which Josie, you tackled in, in, in your presentation, is it's, of course, very important because uh, nobody likes assessors, Let, let's call it for what it is. And uh, assessors are confident in their total values. Uh, and I think they've been trained to not be that confident in splitting land and building values. But in Pennsylvania, uh, and I should say that I'm kind of a political operative. I go from town to town, talk to the assessor, and some assessors say, yeah, I, I can easily defend these values. Uh, but a problem with the land value tax is that you put in tax rates based on a set of assessments. And in the case of Pittsburgh in 2001, the assessments changed dramatically, uh, including the ratio of value uh, between land and buildings. And because of that dramatic change, uh, and unfortunately it was, there was a mayoral campaign at the time, Nobody uh, changed the ratio, which was our, our desperate advice to Mayor Murphy at the time. Uh, you have to rejigger your uh, land value tax rates if there's a reassessment. Uh, and I can say that in some places where there's been a reassessment, like Coatesville, Pennsylvania, we had to recommend that they suspend the land value tax simply because uh, the uh, attention paid to uh, residential land value uh, was such that it reduced the commercial and industrial land value. And so uh, the, the direct impact was to increase taxes on poor people. Coatesville is a very poor community. Uh, in Altoona, they blamed uh, the uh, reassessment for the change in the land value tax. Um, but that was more of a political uh, statement on the part of, of, of the mayor and the council but you have to keep your, your eyes on it. And hopefully in Pennsylvania, we're getting there. Reassessments are occurring more often uh, and they're generally court ordered assessments. Uh, Delaware County, Pennsylvania is a case in point. So yeah, it's a big deal. Some assessors though are, are more than happy with it. James Gall in Allegheny County said, well, yeah, we, we can roll with anything. Yeah, and, and the need to kind of be mindful of why tax bills are moving upward is something that I hear assessors talk a lot about because, you know, they frequently get maligned as an, you're raising my taxes. And I think the point of clarity that I hear folks in that profession make a lot is, I'm not raising your taxes, I'm accurately valuing your property. And if the, your property has increased in value and the tax rate hasn't changed, your bill will go up. And so there's that legislative piece in there as well around the tax rate. And whether you're doing a simple, you know, regular property tax or a land value or a split rate tax, you have to be mindful of changes in value and how there has to be an interplay with your tax rate um, in order to keep things manageable for people. So the next question we have, uh, where can we get legal help to evaluate the legal barrier barriers to LVT in your town, city, county, or state? Um, so I would just say you can call us, Center for Property Tax Reform. Um, we are not a, a law firm, um, but we are in this space quite a bit. And if we don't know the answer immediately, can find it. Um, but Josh, beyond just plugging us, what would you tell uh, William in answer to that question? 
The best uh, advice I can give is to find a pal, a friend in state government, hopefully in the attorney general's office. And uh, in Maryland, which is probably the case that, that I'm most familiar with, uh, they, um, essentially the state government said, you can't have a land value tax. It's you know, right out of the picture. And so we did some research, presented it to the attorney general, Joe Curran, and it's written into the constitution that a land value tax is legal. Uh, in Virginia, which is where uh, all of us are now very active, uh, land value tax, no, you can't do it. And it turns out that it constitutionally it's possible. There's some states where it would be very difficult, but to find the legality, yeah, I'd say contact us. And at the very least, we'll, we'll have a Zoom meeting with people in state government at the Legislative Research Bureau or something of that nature. Yeah, I think interestingly what that question hits on and what you're saying as well is it's, it's not necessarily a slam dunk. You know, it really does vary by location. And so the question about, there's the question of whether it's a good idea and we're very ready to help you figure that out. And that has to do with, you know, how different constituents will be affected, the quality of your assessments, that, that sort of thing. Um, but there's this sort of even more foundational question of whether or not you can do it legally. And so certainly, you know, before you go into the weeds of, you know, is this a good idea? Answering the question of whether it's even an option um, is, is the first step, certainly. Um, yep. The next question, so the question becomes, what is the point of diminishing returns if the LVT drives down land values in the future as the need for revenue and tax rates might tend to increase? I think we kind of spoke to this already, this notion of LVT depressing real estate values, questioning whether that's necessarily the case. Um, the other thing that I would just throw out in response to that is sort of a generic answer that you know, again, there's sort of the two things in motion, right? There's the value of the properties and there's the tax rate. So whether your properties are diminished in value because, you know, the market has collapsed collapsed from, I don't know, a natural disaster or something else, um, or it's because in some instance, LVT has depressed those values, that rate is always, you know, mobile to the extent that that's politically uh, feasible. And so that's a tool in the toolbox um, in that case. Mike or Josh, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, no, I, I think we actually got it. Uh, Mike, what do you say? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that, um, to, to your comment, Josie. Okay, cool. Um, next one, uh, LVT is also a vi vital uh, climate strategy. UC Berkeley has done some fantastic research showing how infill development can reduce emissions through reduced BMT energy consumption, et cetera. As was noted earlier, infill is a key LVT outcome. Absolutely. Um, so again, we can send to the, the attendees a, a document that we've compiled with a lot of the recent research. Infill development, specifically right size development, meaning development that looks like the other development around it is something that has been shown to happen when these policies are implemented. And so, you know, it's good from a municipal finance standpoint and that it reduces pressure to extend services at the periphery. And it's certainly good from an environmental perspective. You're putting, reducing pressure on green space, reducing habitat fragmentation, sort of redu reusing land that has already been, uh, has been used before. Yeah, if I can give a plug to uh, what Mike is doing. Uh, on the Property Tax Explorer, we have the cities, but we also have, uh, maybe we can send out the link uh, a survey of vacant land uh, and underused land in New York City. And when New York City first starts dealing with this, uh, there's always an assumption that, oh, there's no vacant land in New York City, which is couldn't be further from the couldn't be further from the truth. So infill on developable lots is uh, really an untapped resource for affordable housing and and kind of funky organic buildings. Uh, on weird shaped lots. Yeah, and I obviously want to be um, mindful of not squeezing out desirable lower intensity land uses like parks, community gardens. And that's where, you know, you need to kind of fine tune your policy. You know, you can have a land value or split rate tax is kind of your blanket approach. And then of course you wanna, you don't want to disincentivize or make impossible those land uses that, um, might not be highest and best use in terms of economic returns, but are certainly vital to communities. 
Um, yeah, so Josh mentioned the vacant land project. We do have some other research. Another thing that we're about to put out is New York City focused, but it has to do with um, LLCs and ownership and land speculation. Um, so that's a really intriguing, discouraging, infuriating study uh, that we're about to be uh, releasing in the near future. Um, the next two questions, Mike, are actually for you, and I'll, I'll sort of give them in sequence because I think you can respond to them together perhaps. So. Uh, did you have to pay for any of the data inputs to the software tool, or is it based on publicly available data sets? Where might such a tool be able to be applied? And then the other question is, is the Explorer data kept up to date? Yeah, I think those two questions are really related. Um, there's a third question too, which I think is also pretty related, and I can probably answer these all together. Oh, I didn't um, even see that. Okay. The, um, the third one being from Christopher um, asking if we're going to be adding additional cities to tax shift explorer. Um, so starting with Ronald's question, um, at this time, tax shift explorer is built using all publicly available data sets. Um, most cities offer their um, tax lot data um, publicly, usually in like an open data forum um, or on like a publicly available site, sometimes the assessor's site. Um, and most cities also offer GIS data um, containing the polygons for each parcel in the city. Um, so that's where we source all of our data from currently for Tax Shift Explorer. Um, as far as where you can apply Tax Shift Explorer can be applied anywhere where there's a single tax rate for parcels. Um, we have encountered issues um, trying to apply in some cities where there's multiple tax rates applied in different districts in the cities. Um, in the city, like in Chicago. Um, so anywhere where there's just a single tax rate, it's possible to apply Tax Shift Explorer. Um, in terms of keeping it up to date, we refresh Tax Shift Explorer yearly. Um, most cities update and renew their assessments for um, both land value and um, property yearly. So we try to keep up with that and refresh it on a yearly basis. Um, for adding additional cities, we are looking to add additional cities to Tax Shift Explorer. Um, one thing that can be a hindrance to adding new cities is that, not, um, as we mentioned earlier, we get all of our data from publicly available data sets. Not all cities make it easy to acquire their data for um, both tax lot data and their parcels. Um, so in those cases, it can be a little trickier to get um, certain cities on a site if they don't make their avail data readily available. Um, so we have been exploring maybe if there's other options for us getting affordable data for some of the cities where they don't make their data as easily available. Yeah, I would just add um, one of the things that we're looking into doing, because obviously, you know, we love the Tax Shift Explorer and it's a really cool tool, but it's very labor intensive because, you know, Mike's Mike is is the is our GIS guru, and he's doing a lot behind the scenes to you know clean the data and make it such that the explorer can actually do the calculations that it needs to do. Everything has to be uniform. Municipalities' data is anything but uniform. Um, so we're actually right now talking to a data vendor around getting a grant that would allow us to do a more um, probably not as granular, and that has to do with kind of data security, but an interface that would be more far reaching would allow us to express the information for many, many places much more quickly. Um, and then if somebody were to say, hey, that looks pretty good at first blush, I'd love to learn more, then what we'd be able to do would be to pull the data that's actually not from the vendor, but coming from the municipality itself and have those most more specialized um, conversations and, and calculations. Uh, okay. I'm gonna just end us with uh, James Fredrickson's question. I know we are over time, um, but James asks, Cook County, Illinois classifies taxable real estate property into the following categories, vacant residential, vacant commercial industrial, improved single family residential, improved multifamily residential, and improved commercial industrial. Each property is assessed at a rate that is based on its classification. And that is given between a 10% and a 25% of its total property value. Oh, sorry, and that is between 10 and 25%. 
Land and improvements are assessed separately. Can Tax Shift Explorer, using currently available data from the Cook County Assessor's Office, identify how implementing a shift to a land value tax would affect each parcel in Cook County? So that's a question for Mike, but I just want to, before we before Mike says why not, <laughs> I just want to say that um, Cook County is a very interesting study. Um, having just heard their assessor a year ago at the IWO conference talk very candidly about the issues with their assessment data. Uh, let's just say that that we would be reluctant even, and Mike will talk a little bit about why that one's real tricky. Even if we could plug it into the Tax Shift Explorer, I think we would be very reluctant to do so because of what we said already around the need for those really accurate assessments. So Cook County, as you know, has been in the news. ProPublica did a whole number of stories on just how bad their property taxes are in terms of the accuracy of the assessments, and they were right. <laughs> so uh, the assessor for Cook County has been very forthcoming. He's relatively newly elected and kind of inherited um, a hot mess, uh, that they really don't know much about the interiors of most of the structures in the city, and that's super problematic. Um, so even when we're talking about untaxing structures, to the extent that the Explorer allows you to look at those incremental shifts between land and improvement taxes, we just know that it would not be an accurate reflection of what's on the ground. You know, it's an accurate reflection. It could be an accurate reflection of what is on the assessor's roles, but given that they've already sort of explicitly said, we're not super happy with these numbers, what's the good of us kind of pushing that forward. And then maybe Mike, you can talk, talk a little bit. You kind of already did about the complications of that kind of tax system. Yeah. So aside from just kind of the scrutiny around how good the assessments are currently out of Cook County, um, there's just some feasibility issues of putting that data into Tax Shift Explorer just in the way that Tax Shift Explorer is designed and models data. Um, it's really made just to model the data using land and improvements value, land and improvements value, which Cook County doesn't use and is designed for use where there's just a single tax rate. Um, so it would be possible to, to make an application that could work specifically for Cook County, but that's something that we would probably do as a separate venture from Tax Shift Explorer if we were looking to build a tool that can model different types of tax rates um, or accommodate um, multiple different tax rates in one tool. Okay, yeah. we have one more comment. I'll just read it real quickly. Um, it, I don't think it's a question. I think it's just a comment. Um, land value tax looks like a fair way to recover public investment. A good name instead of um, land value capture could be paying back a return on public investment. Just a thought. Uh, maybe it will be more palatable to citizens and officials. Yeah, I mean, nomenclature matters, right? The words you use affect how people interpret what you're saying um, and absolutely value capture is something that I feel like in the planning community and public finance discussions, like it's thrown around a lot and we all know what it means. Um, but I think as soon as you're talking with folks who are not necessarily talking about this stuff every day, you do wanna speak about it in a way that's really, um, it's really clear what, what you're referring to. And this is a good tool to accomplish that end. Yep, and land value capture is paid on a tax bill. So separating and teasing out the two, uh, it's a difficult psychological job. Okay, with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. This recording will be up um, on the website. You'll get an email when that's available. We'll also include a link to the um, summary document that talks about some of the studies that we've cited today um, and to the Tax Shift Explorer, so you can check that out as well. So everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.